What really happened to the Arian 5 rocket? Hi everybody, I'm James from Cycle Studios, and today I'm going to be your guide into the disaster of the Arian 5 rocket. Probably one of the most infamous situations that occurred in the European Space Agency's history. June 4th, 1996 will be a day in infamy for the ESA, as the Arian 5 unmanned rocket had launched into space. However, after about 37 seconds in the air, it had appeared to diverge from its path, implode on itself and within milliseconds. Billions of dollars invested in R&D and millions of dollars invested in the product itself had seemed to fly out the window. A board of investigators was contracted to figure out what happened during this mishap. Before we talk about what caused it, let's look and see if we can infer what happened based on the footage we have of the rocket. So the rocket is moving on on what it's considered its desired path. It starts to nosedive and once it starts to nosedive, there's a 90 degree turn to the left and after that point, it starts to lose control and it implodes on itself. But why does that make any sense? If a rocket is on its desired path with the correct amount of fuel, why would the flight control software suddenly make a large correction in the system to cause an unexpected behavior that then put mechanical stresses on the system which caused it to implode? With the system that's put in place to test these things, it shouldn't be in a million pieces, it should have been in space. So why did it happen? The reasoning of this whole disaster, however, has nothing to do with the mechanical pieces of the system, nor the electrical portions of it. It has to do primarily with the failure of understanding of previous legacy code being ported into a new device, and also the use case of the product. This is a good reminder for experienced programmers, and a lesson for new ones. What happened was overflow. This is taught in every CS 101 course since the beginning of time. And this instance of overflow is probably the most famous and will be taught for ages inside of CS 101 classrooms. As a reminder to not forget about overflow. But what does overflow mean? In computer science, overflow can wear many different hats, but for right now, we're going to stick with integer overflow. To understand what integer overflow is, we kind of have to understand how numbers are represented on computers. On computers, numbers are represented in ones and zeros. Have you ever heard the expression, it's all ones and zeros and pertaining to software? That joke references some real techniques used to store numbers on computers. Ones and zeros in a sequence together can be interpreted as what's called binary. Binary is a sequence form of ones and zeros that represent integer numbers. The way this works is you can take sequences of ones and zeros and assign from right to left incrementing powers of 2 starting at 2 to the 0. A 1 represents the number at 2 to that power, and a 0 represents, well, 0. If you add all the 1's values together, you then get a binary representation of an integer number. So this means that if you only have 8 binary digits, bits, you can represent at max 256 different numbers, anywhere from 0 to 255. 255 would be if there were 8 1's in each column. In programming, there are variables that can represent 8, 16, 32, and 64-bit numbers. So this means, as you work up the ladder from 8 bits to 16 bits, you can go from 255 being the maximum value, and if you go to 16 bits, 65,536 would be the maximum value. However, what if it's a negative number? There seems to be no way to represent it. Well, if we use a technique called the two's complement, we can. It basically represents the first bit as a sign bit and the rest of the bits following, all the way down to the right, in descending order, are the numbers themselves. If we want to represent a signed value, that will effectively cut the range of represented integer values in half due to the largest, most significant power of 2 being cut from the mix. 65,536 now becomes 32,767. And you can go from negative 32,768 all the way up to 32,767. Now this seems pretty straightforward, right? So if we create variables within the right size constraints of that range, we shouldn't have any issues. But what happens when a computer receives a value that is outside the range of what a variable can store? For example, if I have a signed 16-bit integer, and I give it 33,000 instead of its maximum, 32,767, what happens to it? This is the concept known as overflow. If incremented up, it will round down to zero and then go back up the range again. Or it can result in truncation. And depending on your system, if it's stored in little endian or big endian, it will either take the 16 most significant bits or the 16 least significant bits, resulting in a totally different number and really undefined behavior. But this seems kind of ridiculous. If you know that the value is within a certain range, 
How can it ever violate this? And this is where the knowledge of your legacy code and your system becomes absolutely crucial. What went wrong starts with this. The Arian 5 engineers decided to use the primary and backup inertial reference system that was used in the Arian 4 rocket. This was to get around redoing safety certifications on this part of the block design. However, one thing that was overlooked was that the Arian 4 did not have the ability to reach higher horizontal velocities as Arian 5 did. The inertial navigation system was designed such that the primary system would be reading data and outputting controls to make the flight go as planned, and the hot standby would be doing those same calculations in parallel, such that if the primary system had failed, it would switch to the hot standby as if nothing had ever happened. So what actually happened was that the standby system made the overflow calculation and shut itself down. But the primary system, using the same rocket and the same code, also encountered the overflow and shut itself down as well. And at that point, all control was lost in the flight control software. A 64-bit floating point number was converted down to a 16-bit signed integer over the value of 32,767. At this point, the variable overflowed the system saw erroneous values from the flight control software in terms of angular velocity on the hot standby. The hot standby shut itself down. However, the same piece of code was being used on the primary system, and the primary system saw the same horizontal velocity and eventually shut itself down. This allowed the rocket to lose total control and caused the system to malfunction. In order to understand this mistake, I'll put it in a different context. Let's say you work for Bugatti as an engineer. And your job is to design a speed sensor array to keep track of the new Bugatti Chiron speed. This speed value will be used for things like cruise control and the speedometer. You have two options. One, you could work from the ground up and design your own speed sensor array, which would take a lot longer and would also be more expensive. Or you can pull from an older Bugatti speed sensor array, which is already past safety and quality measures and would be cheaper. Due to time and budget constraints and pressure, you decide to go with the old system and retrofit it for the new one. Unbeknownst to you is that the speed variable is an 8-bit integer and can only reach 255 before it either overflows or truncates. This is problematic, specifically because multiple systems depend on this speed variable to make decisions. The reason you decided to design it this way is because you needed to make the deadline for the Bugatti launch Chiron launch party. This fictional event had called for a new top speed run done on site with everyone to watch. The track being used to run it is on a bank. In order to obtain the target speed, the driver has to go 255 or over miles per hour on the bank sections. The car's stability and traction control system depends on the speed value in order to help determine what's going on. Unfortunately, due to overflow, the car loses control at 256 miles an hour and slams into the wall. While this seems like an extreme example, things like this can be possible, in the same context as to what the rocket does. In the Arian 5 codebase, there was a 64-bit floating point number which represented the horizontal velocity of the rocket with respect to the platform. The Arian 4 codebase required a 16 signed bit integer. This method is actually totally acceptable and able to be used if two cases are true. The first one, obviously, is if it doesn't overflow. You have to make sure that variable never increases past 32,767. That's requirement number one. Requirement number two would be to make sure that the digits of precision you have in the 64-bit floating point number are not needed when converting down to the 16-bit equivalent. In this case, both cases were violated tremendously. So as you can imagine, as the rocket builds up horizontal velocity, it approaches that 32,767 limit that is set by a signed 16-bit integer. Once it reached that point, you can start to see the rocket dip, and once the rocket dips, the flight correction software comes in to try and save it. And unfortunately, it wasn't able to and caused it to implode on itself. This situation is a prime example of how systems, even in the most safety critical pieces of technology, can potentially be flawed. While I'm not specifically blaming the developers here, I think it outlines an important lesson that as a developer, you need to be keen about your piece of the system to ensure it works properly all the way through. And not only that your piece works properly, but all the pieces it interacts with you understand with to a T, so that way you know the input-output parameters of each block and also what the system is capable of. While it is a problem that the quality control did not catch this issue, 
as this would be assumed to be a test case, considering that within 40 seconds of operation, an unacceptable input was received that caused the destruction of this rocket, and $7 billion were pumped into the R&D of this thing, as a developer, you need to be able to catch these things up front. So this is one big reminder for those who develop, and one big lesson for those who are just getting into it, overflow matters. Your architecture and hardware matters. Understand them and minimize your mistakes and you will be one heck of a software developer. So this is what happened to the Ariane 5 rocket and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And also, if you have any ideas on what I can do videos on in the future regarding this particular topic, please leave them in the comments below. I'm James from Zygal Studios. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next video.